Cool. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, so yeah, so um, the main the main kind of purpose of this, what what I intend for it to be, is that you guys can ask as many questions as you like, um, and uh, Jabril, we we can you can stop me at various uh, various points, or after every slide, and we can ask some questions. So the main contents we're going to talk about myself, what I do, uh, the MRCS exam. We're going to talk about the self assessment uh, criteria and the portfolio um, as an overview. Um, uh, we'll talk about the person specification briefly. Um, shortlisting and ranking and then the main thing will be a Q&A for people to ask questions um, okay so a bit about me so as uh, Jabril um, kindly introduced my name is Tyra Oyebola I'm a core surgical trainee year one and what that means is um, uh, so in the UK, uh, I'm not sure what level of training people are at, if they're medical students or uh, F1s or F2s. Jabril said it's mostly that kind of level. So um, after F1 and after F2, so you complete a foundation training, then the next stage in order to enter a surgical, to become a surgeon, is you have to, most people do core surgical training. Uh, there are some specialties that have a run through, up, run -through option, um, such as cardiothoracic neurosurgery, um, so they enter at ST1 level, um, and there was a trial of a run through for um, for some core surgical training roles, which is stopped now called um, IST. But essentially, I'm a first year surgical trainee, um, and what that means is, um, oh, I'll, I'll go into I'll go into uh, what 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 I kind of do uh, in my role. Um, uh, so my current program uh, is a urology themed program. So uh, most core surgical programs in the country are themed um, towards a certain specialty. Some of them are kind of broad-based or they, they kind of, um, it's not really a, a real theme. They're not, they're not really aiming towards a specific specialty. Um, but for instance, my, my program was a, uh, as a two year program, uh, 18 months of urology and six months of uh, general surgery. Um, so the general surgery is to really get you a good grounding in just basic operating, basic laparoscopic and open skills, which general surgery offers. And urology doesn't really give you a good, good um, training in that, or as much opportunity to do that as, a, as an SHO. Um, and course surgical training is essentially a two-year program towards that. So if anyone who didn't know, that's kind of like an overview. And why I chose urology. So, um, and I hope there are some budding urologists. If not, hopefully we can kind of convince you to. Um, so urology is is challenging. Um, so it's it's a um, it's, it's not especially that's really well known about. Um, it's not really taught well. I found particularly well in medical school. Um, it's a small specialty. Uh, so it's quite it's quite cool to when you go to conferences and that kind of thing. You see the same faces. So um, it, it's small in that way, but it's it's challenging. So what I'm interested in specifically is uro oncology. So that's taking out bladders, taking out kidneys. Um, taking out kidneys and ureters, prostates, and that kind of thing, which is challenge, technically challenging surgery. And working in the retroperitoneum is going to be kind of quite um, uh, technically challenging and dangerous surgery sometimes as well. So I, I kind of like that, but it's varied. So you can do uh, diagnostics if you're not interested in kind of big operating. Um, you can sub-specialize in various areas, including core urology, oncology, gynae, functional urology, neurourology. And as far as surgical specialties go, it's got quite a nice lifestyle um, um, compared to general surgery and orthopedics, for, for instance. So that, that's a bit about me. And I suppose if there, there are any questions just now, or shall I carry on? Yeah, nothing so far, man. Okay, so guys, I encourage you to ask questions if at any point as well, because um, otherwise this presentation is gonna be quite short, but anyways. <laughs> it's a good one, don't worry. Bro. So the role of a core surgical trainee. Um, so the core surgical trainee is essentially the bridge between the foundation doctors uh, who are generally on the ward and the registrars who can be in theatre, can be in clinic, and can, uh, or can, can be in various other areas. Um, and your role is just as a more experienced foundation doctor who, who's just come from foundation training, knows how things generally run on the ward, but you're also trying to step up and try to learn how to be a registrar in the operating, uh, start to sit your exams, start to prepare to be a registrar with your applications and to be a point of um, call for foundation doctors should they have like uh, have some kind of queries that don't necessarily need to be escalated all the way to the registrar or 
uh, if a patient deteriorates in the wards, just to be a cool head around, just to be helpful, um, who someone who's had kind of more experience in, in certain situations, just just to be around and be helpful generally. Uh, and the daily role will vary by job. So um, my first rotation of um, my core training year, uh, or oh, CT one year, which is the year I'm in, um, I had a general surgery rotate. Uh, so I had a urology rotation, which is where I met Jarrell. Um, and in that role, I was pretty much um, self-directed. So I went to the I visited the ward in the morning, make sure the staffing was okay, and then I'd go to the theatre or to clinic and just try to jump into the ward uh, and be helpful where I could. And towards the beginning of the rotation, um, I tried to be on the ward more. But towards the end, as the foundation doctors um, uh, get more experience, you can kind of leave the wards and leave the foundation doctors their own devices. So you find that as a core surgical trainee, that you're um, kind of floating between the two roles, between the foundation um, kind of level and the registrar level. Um, but you're uh, on call, you're, you're, you're on the on-call rotor for at the SHA level. Um, but in some regions and some specialties, the CT2, so the second year of the core surgical training program, um, the CT2s will be um, on the registrar rotor if they've passed their exam, the MRCS exam. Um, which will go on to how uh, kind of my tips about the the uh, MRCS exam. Um, so that that that's pretty much that. Um, any questions uh, there, or should we carry on? Yeah, carry on, lad. Okay. But if anybody wants to ask questions, you can do it as as uh, power goes along. Anything that pops into your mind, and we'll try to make it like more interactive. But yeah, go ahead, Dave. Cool. So the MRCS exam. So this is a this is a behemoth. This is a big exam, um, and I thankfully just passed it um, last February. I passed the Part B. Um, so your title changes from Doctor to Mister. So I haven't got a big head about that, I promise. Um, so um, it's a two part exam, um, um, and the let me see if I can just um, share share the um, the MRCS. So the Royal College of Surgeons websites because that might be helpful. Um, can can people hold on can people is my screen sharing Jabril? yeah i can see your the we can see the page we can see the page fine um so yeah the mrcs exam you can see there 550 pounds you don't want to sit that twice if you if you can avoid it um, and it's a, it's a five hour exam. Uh, there's two um, uh, single best answers and multiple choice papers. Uh, 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 the first exam is three hours and the second exam is two hours. Um, the first exam encompasses uh, applied basic science and the second exam is principles of surgery. Um, so the applied basic sciences is kind of the stuff you would look at in final year of medical school in your finals. Maybe a slightly higher level, but most of it is at kind of med school, final year of med school level. Um, and the principles of surgery is that's the bit that's mostly going to be new. So then you're talking about surgical techniques, you're talking about suture materials, you're talking about um, uh, dealing with critically unwell patients, that kind of thing. And a lot of that will be new. So um, um, so we'll go into tips about the exam uh, about the exam later on. Um, and then the part B, um, this exam is £997. So again, you don't want to you don't want to sit that twice if you can. And it's worth mentioning that most um, I don't think the study budget um, will um, will kind of uh, kind of give you any support towards these exams. So you're mostly paying out of pocket for them. Um, so yeah, if you can avoid sitting them twice, then by all then. Uh, take every step you can to do that uh, it's not loading but the part b exam essentially is a half day um oski about 18 stations um which kind of runs through various domains um so uh, off the top of my head um the, the domains were critical care um uh, and uh kind of physiology and then there was uh, anatomy uh, communication skills and uh, clinical skills. So there are 18 stations which encompass all these kind of main domains. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's not loading. Uh, let's just go back to the slides. Um, uh, 
Is that is the slide shared again? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, so yeah, so you you have to and it, those domains the, and the various stations are split into halves, so the knowledge section and the skill section. And in order to pass the exam, you need to pass both sections independently. So it's not as if you can have a good half of sit half the stations really well, fail half the stations, and just pass. It, you kind of have to do well overall. Um, I can go into more detail about that later if people have more questions. Uh, and the same thing with the Part A exam, actually. So each exam, you have to pass independently and you have to um, achieve the overall pass mark between both exams. So again, so it's, it's about having that, that breadth. Um, Royal College fees. Um, so just, it's just a bit to say that the um, um, full membership of the college is, is quite expensive. So I remember when I passed the, the Part B exam, they send you an email essentially saying, congratulations, Mr. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so. Here's a bill for 500 or something pounds for your, all your hard work. So that wasn't very nice, but we, we, we carry on. Um, but uh, prior to membership, uh, full membership, you can join as an affiliate membership member to most the, to the Royal College of Surgeons in any country. And that gave you some perks, like some access to some libraries and um, um, some journals and that kind of thing. Um, and if you're a taxpayer, you can you can reclaim the tax back on these um, generally. Um, okay, any questions there? So far, um, still, I got, no, yeah, that's about, no, no questions so far. Okay, we'll carry on then. Um, So um, the part A exam. So some tips and tricks. So this is the bit that might that might you you, you might have questions about. So feel free to feel free to ask. Um, so I'll just share share my screen. Actually, no, I'll just I'll stay on this slide. Um, so the part A. Um, I'm not sure how many people are in F1, uh, F2, or a, a medical school. For the medical students, um, don't perhaps don't worry about this so much. Um, if you're really keen, you can, you're keen to sit as early as possible, then by all means try to start revising for it during final year. But I think final year is your last kind of semblance of freedom. And just don't just, I, I'd say, I'd personally say, just don't be that keen and maybe sit it towards the end of your um, F1 year or beginning of F2 year. So I personally sat it during my first rotation of F2 uh, and I revised for it during my final rotation of F1. So it's about three and a half months of, uh, of well, three and a half to four months of revision for me. Um, and I think the main way to, to tackle this exam is past questions. You'll have latent knowledge from medical school, which will stick. And a lot of the um, knowledge from the exam comes from medical school. There are new bits. There are a lot of new bits, to be fair, which you have to read about, uh, read around. Um, but um, the closer, and they've done studies on this, actually, you can look it up. The closer you sit, um, the part A exam to your to um, um, graduating medical school, the better you do. You're still in the exam frame of mind. You still have your medical knowledge that's still kind of um, sloshing about there somewhere. So it's worth trying to sit it early. Uh, lots of my colleagues as core trainees who are still trying to sit the exam. Um, it's a bad place to be. Um, so that would be one piece of advice if you can, if I take you, if you take away anything from this from this. Um, I got a question, uh, Ty. Yeah. It said, uh, sorry, I missed this part. But is there a compensation over the two papers, part A, or do you need to pass both independently? I think they mean. Uh, yeah. Go on. So, so, it's, so the question is, do you, do you need to pass both parts of the part A independently? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you need to pass each exam. You need to pass each exam. Yeah. Okay. No and 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 your overall pass. You can't. You can't kind of. Um, uh scrape both kind of thing you need to there's like an overall pass mark as well mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah what about in terms yeah. of compensation like do you need to if you want to um reclaim uh reclaim tax oh um, no, no no so so you pay for the exam the 550 pounds for the entire exam okay but uh, so for, for both for both parts so the exam is essentially one it's essentially a five hour exam that's split in two Yes, so yeah. it's what it's one exam. Sorry, I may may not been clear there. So it's one exam that's split into two halves. So just just for each, so you're not sitting down for three and for five hours. 
Okay. So the first half is the kind of applied basic science, which is three hours, and then the second bit is um, uh, kind of surgical science and that kind of stuff. And that's a oh. second two hours, but it's all one exam. You pay five hundred fifty pounds for the whole thing, and you claim tax back on the whole five hundred fifty pounds. Oh. And in terms of passing, you gotta pass both parts to pass part A, part A, right? Yeah, yeah. You can't get like it's not it's not like an average thing. It's not it's not it's not a complete average, no. So, no, no, it's not an average at all, really, is it? Then yeah, you have to pass both parts. Yeah. Okay, fair. That's it. Thanks. Um. So some tips. Um. I used EMRCS and past tests. My, my me and my colleagues who sat the exam kind of similar times felt that EMRCS was the most representative question bank. Um, past, so I personally did EMRCS twice. There were about 2,000, maybe 2,500 questions in the bank. But prior to the exam, I got through EMRCS twice. Um, so that's important to do. Um, past tests I used as well, just for repetition. The actual questions were quite, the, the quality was variable. And the, some of the questions were really hard. Some of the questions were really easy. Um, but I found the question, the question bank was good for repetitions. If you're just thinking, psychologically and maybe kind of neuropsychologically seeing novel questions so seeing new questions um itself is a, being able to tackle them as a skill it, it employs various kind of you have to use more fluid knowledge rather than and applied knowledge rather than using crystalline crystalline knowledge so if you're just going through emrcs over and over again you can get quite stuck in that but towards the end of my exam period, I used past test questions just so that I was looking at new questions. So I could practice looking at new questions, if that makes sense. Um, you can consider using, and sorry, and it's worth, it's worth saying that the, the, the method I used was, I didn't use any, any books or any courses. I literally just used those two question banks and read around them. So um, using Wikipedia, Google, Google images, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm not saying that books and courses that aren't helpful and other people have used them, but I personally didn't use them. Um, um, the part B exam is a half day OSCE. Um, I will get, get up the Royal College website, but it's not loading. Um, um, and my advice would be to sit that in your core training year. Um, so if some people decide to sit it earlier, if they're keen, um, and by all means do that if you want to, but because um, I, I found that core training was the best time for me because one um a lot of the stuff in the exam you're coming across in work anyway so things like suture materials how to suture and like just sort of different sort of suturing techniques different procedures such as chest drains uh, and excising abscesses excising lesions um and um all kind of these kind of more practical things you're already doing whereas as a foundation doctor you're not really in theatre, you're not really allocated to theatre so that kind of like uh, like that. So you don't really, you're not really exposed to these things as much. And you'll find that um, as a course surgical trainee, your deanery will run courses for you. So in in um, uh, East Midlands North, which is my deanery, or East Midlands, but the north part of East Midlands, the, the training programme director actually ran a course for us, which was really helpful. Um, and it was free, so I didn't have to pay thousands of pounds for, for a course. Uh, in my opinion, books are helpful. So the books I've listed here are the books I used. Um, so uh, Doctor Exam, there's two books, um, part, a, uh, part one and part two of the Doctor Exam books, Kanani Critical Care Vibers, Anatomy for the MRCS, um, uh, and uh, online resources. So I used past the MRCS website, again, which was really helpful for me. Courses tend to be more helpful. So if you want to spend money on a course, then by all means, that's very helpful. And I think there's there's the there's a um is it Doctor's Academy or Doctor Exam course? Um there are there are courses that run anatomy course and that kind of thing, which people sometimes find helpful. Um, but the main thing with the part B exam is just practical practice, finding a colleague, someone who sits in the exam with you, and just just practicing. So I found a colleague who who was sitting the exam, um, or actually a group of us, and we just week on week we're just working on the exam working on the exam practicing practicing stations practicing talking just practicing being presentable as well uh, and that that's kind of the main way to tackle that exam now i anticipate there will probably them will there, will there is there any questions on that or, or uh, maybe there will be towards uh, the end there was there's one question <clears throat> on the on the main chat uh, not directly related to what you were talking about but it's basically um yusuf was saying a uh, question to tyro how can international doctors uh, or surgeons back uh, in, in their home country apply 
for core surgical training uh, or surgical jobs while they're back in the home country? Would you, do you have any idea? Um, so I wouldn't be too particularly experienced, um, experienced with that process. Um, hmm. Because um, it, it, it's, it's a national, it's a national process. You need to have, um, I imagine you need to, the, the various exams such as PLAB and that kind of thing in order yeah. to get GMC registered. So if we go to the, um, let me go, let me share the screen for the person specification. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, so it says, you'll, obviously you will have your medical degree. Um, you need to be fully licensed. So sat the plab and that kind of thing and be licensed with the GMC. Um, I think there may be the IELTS exam or something that also kind of some language proficiency test as well. Um, so I'd advise that you look through the person spec. Um, as far as applying from abroad, I have to say, I, I'm not sure what that process would, would be like. I've only done it, I've only done it, haven't been a graduate from here. Um, sorry, I can't be more helpful with that. I definitely say look at the person spec. And I imagine there are, there are people who have gone through it um, who, who might be able to, maybe in the, in the BSMA as well, who, who may have gone through it as well. So, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. No worries. What I'll do is someone actually put, um, I'll just put the uh, Slido code on the main chat so people can go on and access it there, basically. But yeah, okay, you can continue. Uh, okay, so next, next one. So the self-assessment. So yeah, this bit. So my, my advice about the self-assessment, you just you just need to look at what what it what it what it entails. There's there's no getting around um, um, what you need to do in order to in order to um, uh, do it. So this is the self-assessment for this year. So it changes year on year. So it, the, the year I applied, it was quite different to this. Different bits were emphasized. Um, there were bits that I had to do that you that they don't have to do this year. So it's worth just looking at these. You can find these online. Um, um, so if you just go down. So in my year, you didn't have to have passed the exam to get a point. You just have to assess it. But now you need to have passed the part A. So if you can pass the part A, that gives you lots of points. So that's why I was saying, like, if you can sit it early, please do so. Um, courses so i personally sat i think i did als bss national catheter education program um uh, and i think i did another course as well maybe in the stock i can't remember um um but yeah so courses are there if you have not got a logbook we'll go through it to the to go to um go to it on the next on the next slide but if you haven't got a logbook then e logbook so e then so the letter e then logbook is an online uh, electronic surgical logbook you can log all your cases and you can say at the bottom what you've done in the cases as well um, um and th that'll be important because then later on when you go to apply you need to print out the logbook get it signed get it stamped by a, by a consultant to to ratify it so um it's important to get your logbook sorted out and as i say e-logbook if anyone's making notes uh surgical conferences yeah if you can attend conferences great um, ASIT, A-S-I-T, they do good student conferences and conferences for foundation doctors. And if you're interested in the specific specialty, then um, going to their conferences as well is, is an option. There'll be, there'll be foundation rates and medical student rates, so it'll be cheaper for you to go them for people like me. Um, certificate experience, so if you've taken an elective, so if there are any kind of really junior medical students here, then uh, plan your elective well, try and do a surgical elective. Um, and then it goes through, so things like degrees, um, prizes, audits. So for my foundation doctors, getting involved in audits, planning them, um, enacting them, uh, and, and repeating cycles is all very useful. Um, and we'll go through some of my tips about that as well. Um, and teaching programs. So what, what Jabril is doing here uh, with the BSMA, and so this kind of thing would count. Um, as a as a as a teaching program, um, and getting and getting feedback on it, whether that's from a from a consultant or co or collating feedback forms, all of that's um, good evidence that you that you that you've done it. Um, 
teaching qualifications. Most people won't have, I did training the trainer, which was quite expensive just for a single point, but I did it because and it turns out I needed the point in my year because it was quite competitive when I applied. Um, and that would have only given you one point, but it's worth looking up um, courses that you can do. Um, training the trainer took me two days, a two day course. Um, and uh, yeah, it gave me a point, but most people at F1 and F2 level won't have, enough, won't have had enough time to do a master's in education or PG cert. So these are kind of, uh, kind of more difficult to do. Presentations. So oral presentations, poster presentations. Again, um, if you can get the get these done, I'll, I'll give you some tips about what I did to get my. I've, I've done two oral presentations, a couple of posters, and a couple of publications. So I'll give you my tips about how to do those. Um, are these just, just publications? Um, so I, I'm not going to go through it at length. It's worth just looking looking through these, um, looking through the the, the self assessment, and just seeing what what you can do, making yourself a list of what you need to achieve by when. Um, surgical training or becoming a surgical trainee, it's just about organization. Uh, you don't need to be particularly brilliant. You just need to just be organized, really. Um, any questions on that? Yeah, we've got one for logbooks. Um, he said, for logbooks, if you have any, if you have operations you have seen abroad, how would you log those without a CHI number? Uh, a CHI number. I'm not. I'm not. Is it? Is that like a patient identification number? Uh, what? what, what? No, I'm not trying to show myself. But generally speaking, say um, you probably met surgeons um that worked abroad and uh, um, yeah. So would you know in terms of the e their e log books, like how would they like show or present? I mean, if you if you ever if you ever spoken to any registrars or or surgeons, how they manage? Yeah. What do you do? You know how they manage to basically update their portfolios in that sense? um so they came with logbooks again so i have not spoken to so perhaps if, if i knew that they were going to be international i may have done some preparation apologies so i no. um I, i'm i'm not sure how they've they they transported or they um, translated their experience from back home um if i'll show i can show you what the e-log book looks like just to um just to guide guide your question um, to see if it's helpful at all. So let me show my screen. Um, I'm not sure if you can see, if you can see that. So um, you the way the way it works. So you go to you go to um, the front page and you press Add Operations, um, and you can go by specialty, and you put in a patient ID. You never put in like patient's actual name or anything, put in their, their date of birth, their age or whatever, the ASA of the patient. You don't even need to put the consultant um, and you put what's important that you put in what you did. So did you observe, were you training someone? Did you perform the operation? Were you supervised while doing the operation with the trainer in theaters unscrubbed or scrubbed? Or were you assisting and you find an operation? So for instance, if I was doing a nephro ureterectomy, you, yeah, lap nephrotomy. I press that. Type in where I did it. Um, so I think it does, it, this. There will be hospitals everywhere. So I don't know Sloan. That's in America. So Sloan Catering is in America. So there'll be. I'm not sure if it will show hospitals from where you're, where whoever the question, person person is asking the question, wherever they are. And you can put some notes, and that that's pretty much how the e log book works. And then. At, at the end you can get you can say i've done i've probably done more than that i just haven't logged all of them um but then these are these are some of the operations that i've been involved in oh tyro um, yeah basically i think with the chr number he mentioned basically like uh then an equivalent for the nhs number but um, yeah but um he just i think more or less um from the surgeons i spoke to it was um they said that basically just um they need to get assigned by a registered gmc doctor and um, and then he has to be able to use an e log book. So if they can put, if they can, if they follow what you just mentioned using the e log book, and they can fill in those criteria, then it should be able to work basically. Okay, there's your answer. But, and the GMT doctor that needs to sign off is their consultant as well. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Coolio. Uh, so we'll move to the next slide.
so yeah so my tips as i've already mentioned um starting the logbook now especially for my um, medical students f1s and f2s if you have a start a logbook now there's no point crying over spilt milk start a logbook now um courses so bss als national catheter education program which is like an online course all of them give you points look on the person on the um, self-assessment criteria for courses that count um, essentially any course in that list on the, on the list will count so um, uh, let me see if it says anything on the self-assessment uh, courses 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 Hold on one sec. Course. course. It doesn't it doesn't give any. Um, in my years, they gave they gave me gave us specific courses. Maybe because more courses are coming out uh, post COVID. But um, let's look at the the the, the self assessment criteria about kind of the kind of courses that they're looking at. Uh, the courses need essentially need to have CPD accreditation, and that will be fine. Um, audits. So I've already mentioned about audits. Um, I found that um, a lot of my colleagues who've come from abroad don't have as much um, um, audits, not as, as emphasized um, back there. Um, so that I think that's probably one of the more novel things, especially for the people who are logging in or, or, or look at, or kind of seeing how to get into core training from abroad. Um, so it's worth us looking up what an audit cycle is, how audits work, um, if they're national um, or kind of regional or local guidelines that you can audit against, um, then yeah, but for my F1s and F2s um, and medical students in the, uh, in the UK, um, seeing if you can get involved in audits that are already running in the department or thinking of your own audits. So audits that I came up with as an F1 so I did a cardiology job and I was just, uh, I noticed um, that, so most audits can, a lot of audits you can think of from kind of, where do you think there is um, uh, a deficiency or an inefficiency in your department? Um, so that's for quality improvement and for audits then just, yeah, just looking at kind of various national or local or regional guidance, guidelines. So I did, a, I did a quality improvement project, not an audit, quality improvement project looking at um, improving the, um, the, the provision of driving advice post um, ST elevation MI and non ST elevation MI. Because um, DVLA says you essentially can't drive for a number of weeks or a number of days after an MI. Um, so and we weren't giving patients any advice about that. So I just made, did a quality improvement project. I spoke to IT about amending our, our, um, our discharge letter pro forma. And then that was, that was it. And then there's the quality improvement project and I increased it by 30 something percent. Um, and yeah, presented that in the m, &M meeting and then I got a prize for that. So you can see how you can start to stack these things up by doing an audit, trying to get presented, trying to apply for a prize, trying to get it published. You start stacking these things up so you can get multiple um, benefits from a single project. Um, teaching as this kind of thing, what Jabril's doing now, that, that kind of thing is quite helpful. Leadership. So if you can be a leader on a national or kind of or regional committee, that would be really excellent. Um, I didn't do anything nationally or regionally. I could have got more points there, but I was um, uh, FY rep for the trust, um, uh, foundation year, um, rep for the trust. Um, and I don't think I did anything else. I could have, I should, could have got more points in the section. And sit part A if you can. And it's my final piece of advice. Any questions there before I move on to the next slide? Yeah, um, a few um, questions, actually. Um, I was going to say, um, so one of the things um, that was asked, basically, if, if someone is like completing their medical degree, how harshly are grade looked down? At, for example, if you had to reset an exam, or is there just, or does it really, does it really matter? Uh, you know, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. Yeah? Doesn't doesn't does not matter at all. I think it. The only the only way it matters if you've done really really well. So if you won a prize, then that's helpful. But if you like the person who graduated last in med school is still still called doctor. And if you if you if you, if you look at the the um, self assessment criteria, it said nothing about your where you got graduated from med school. Anyone can become, anyone can a surgeon. You just need to be organised and, and committed. Okay. 
another question was basically, um, you know, Ty, um, this is probably at, at your own pace, whenever you feel, if you feel like whenever you finish the PowerPoint or not, like how, how was life for you as a core surgical trainer? Like, you know, how did you find the day-to-day -day aspect of it as well? So whenever you feel like you can... Discuss. Yeah, maybe I'll... Can, can, you make, can you make a note of that question? Maybe I'll answer that one at the end. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'll just re-ask you that at the end and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. And then uh, we'll go from there. Cool. So the person specification, we, we've gone through this, uh, but there's a bit I want to show, especially my people who are logging from abroad and for my F2s I think, who are thinking about F3s or even my F1s who are thinking about F3 years. So that's years after foundation training. Um, something that's caught out some of my some of my good friends actually, and my, and my colleagues. So see the, so the personal specifications here, hopefully you can see that. Look at this bit highlighted here. So 18, uh, applicants must have 18 months or less experience in surgery. So uh, after completion of foundation modules. So for my foundation F1 and F2 doctors, after you finish foundation years, um, you're thinking about locuming, you're thinking about um, doing clinical fellow years. Um, as soon as you hit 18 months of, in any surgical specialty, neurosurgery, general surgery, TNO, plastics, uh, you hit 18 months, any experience over that post foundation, post F2 is experience that essentially disqualifies you from applying to post surgical training. Then you're stuck applying at ST3 level or, um, or um, Caesaring or doing like another pathway to get into training or to become a consultant. So that's worth looking looking into or being aware of. Um, career progression is pretty much uh, kind of after core training, you become a registrar, you can do other things. Um, some people are having to extend their core surgical training due to, due to COVID and not getting enough surgical numbers or passing their exams. So as I say, try and pass your exams early. Um, so yeah, so there are loads of options. Yeah, that's, that's just a slide saying that. Um, any 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 questions on that? Uh, not so far, no. Cool. So um, the core surgical training interview. So um, um, perhaps I could have said, said something about the portfolio, but um, I think I just wanted this wanted this to be an overview. Um, um, yeah, well, I've already mentioned the portfolio, so that's fine. Um, but the so the interview the interview uh, was done virtually this year. Um, I don't think they anticipate. I don't anticipate they're going to make it face to face anytime soon because it worked quite well virtually. So I did it on Teams, um, and as you can see here, it is a, um, a cessation. It had it had um, it had a couple of stations. Exam there was a um, interview that had a couple of stations, um, uh, and you just need to look through uh, on the um, on the published guidance about what the exam what the interview entails because it might change by the time um you come to do the interview oh sorry um are you trying to show something on your screen at the moment oh sorry 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 yeah my bad uh, can you see that yeah much better yeah so um so yeah so the management so the management section uh so um you have to give a presentation. So I think my presentation was, the question asked was, can you talk about the time in which you had to show teamwork um, in the context of, um, in the surgical context or something like that? So you have to give a, a very brief presentation that you memorized uh, about a time in which you showed um, teamwork or was it leadership or something in, in the surgical context. Um, uh, and you'll receive that title uh, kind of a few a few weeks before the exam. And then you get some questions. So they grill you about the presentation. And there's uh, the, 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 the books and the resources that I kind of show you in the next slide will be helpful for this kind of, for this for this section. Um, and then the next section, uh, the next part of the management section is you get asked about a scenario such as um, you find a colleague um, drunk at work. How do you manage it? Um, my specific scenario was discussing um, DNA CPR order with a family member of a patient who was kind of very unwell, who was kind of not fit for a haircut. 
um, and I had to discuss that with a family member um, um, and essentially say how I'd approach that and who or how I'd escalate that um, if I was having problems and then they ask you questions about it. Um, and in the clinical section, so there's generally a um, a uh, a um, kind of a stable patient, a scenario in a stable patient, a scenario in an unstable patient. So my two scenarios were um, a septic patient um, with deranged LFTs. Um, I was seeing an A and E who was acutely unwell with sepsis, and you can essentially have to manage them um, uh, appropriately. I don't, I don't want to go through it, go 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 into it at length. Maybe you can ask me some questions if you want to want some more details about that at the end. Um, um, yeah, but the interview is just the interview and just look at um, the format of the interview prior to it and just, just prepare accordingly. Um, so some of the books that I use for the interview. Um, whoops. Um, so this book, Medical Interviews, this um, CTCST, uh, CTSD and Registrar Interviews, that book is probably the single best book. Um, everyone swears by it. Um, and that's for kind of the, the questions that the, inter the interviewers ask. They ask questions verbatim from this book in the interview so it's worth it's worth getting this this book um this book course as your interview book was quite good for the clinical scenarios i found um so kind of just when you're practicing with your colleagues you can go from this book and you can ask questions ask each other questions and when you got through the end of this book you can find that you can even make up questions that you can ask your colleagues as well um so you can just practice by just making up questions after you've gone through this book it's worth mentioning that I'm not being paid by any of these people. These are just the resources I used. Um, and Medibuddy was, again, quite good. Um, the website um, is quite cheap, £60, pounds, um, and it gives you loads of um, um, clinical scenarios as well that you can walk through. Uh, you can practice um, in your own time or with, with colleagues. And those are the only three resources I really use besides just practicing with people. Um, Yeah, any questions on that? Um, not so far. Thank okay. Uh, and then, yeah, there we are. Um, so ranking. So you're ranked nationally. Um, um, so in the year I applied, there were 2,000, about 2,500 applicants and there were about 600 jobs. So they rank you in the country. And then you rank all the jobs in the country yourself. So you, you end up, it takes a whole day to rank all these jobs. Um, and then you tend, they essentially match you up with your rank. Um, yeah. So, so essentially the way it works, at least the way it works for my year, is that they, they um, whittled you down the 2,500 or they whittled you down by your portfolio score, so your self-assessment score. So you go in, you self-assess your own portfolio, okay? Um, then you submit that self-assessment to Oriel. Um, they rank you off the basis of that. And then um, once you've um, been long-listed, um, they ask you to submit all of your evidence for the self-assessment for your self-assessed score. So then you, you put in the evidence and then they, then the panel of consultants will look at your evidence, look at your score and make sure they match up. Um, some people have been caught out where they've over um, egged their self-assessment and it, it, can, it can become a probity issue. So pe like, people can get in quite a lot of trouble if they over egg it too much or if they've, they've, it's been proven that if they've tried to be fraudulent. So it's worth being aware of that. You can't just give yourself an amazing score and not have evidence to back it up, robust evidence to back it up. Um, and then after that, you get we get given an interview if you rank highly enough on your verified self-assessment score. Um, uh, and then the interviews, as I've mentioned, and you, you get a job or not. Um, and then the offer, so this, this um, they, they will, they will um, publish this at the beginning of the interview season or the, the application season about the, the, the general timeline of how things are going to go that year. So those are just some, some general um, kind of deadlines for things to happen by. Um, so it's just worth being aware of those when, 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 by the time it comes to apply. Um, 
and the one thing one thing I want to say um, about competition, especially for my F1s and F2s, um, course surgical training is becoming more competitive. I'm not sure why. Um, part of it is because um, um, uh, I think fewer people did F3, fewer people were electing to step out of training just due to COVID and that people weren't able to travel. So that's why perhaps it was more competitive in my year. May not be as competitive um, by the time you guys come to apply. Um, but um, competition ratios don't matter. If you want, if you want to do something in medicine, it's, you just need you just need to apply. And you need to do it because someone has to get the job. Um, so I I applied on a whim almost. I mean, I did have I was working towards it, but I didn't think I'd be good enough to get an interview. Um, and to be fair, I scraped in the interviews. To be honest, we were just some really good applicants my year. Um, but when it came to interview, I essentially got full marks in the interview. Um, I prepared well I um, really worked on trying to kind of express myself properly and speak properly and that kind of thing um, and I and I managed to kind of rank quite highly in the country um, so all that's to say like your portfolio may not be excellent and um, you may feel like you don't have the strongest application but like you just you just need to apply like competition ratios don't matter um, um, to you as an individual perhaps for the big cheeses in, in the country uh, in the, in, who had the kind of core training, that kind of thing is important for them and not for you as an individual, you just need to apply and do your best. Um, so that's that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm not sure if, if you just go straight to questions or. Yeah, so um, see so if people can just um, uh, ask questions through the Slido um, QR code and the, uh, and the number, um, as people have done so far. Um, there's one other doctor here that wanted to ask you a question. Um, I would be okay with that. Let me just. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hi. Um, so there's two questions that I wanted to ask, um, especially for those that are applying for core surgical training. Um, if they were to get a job, if, for example, if they wanted to go into ENT or they got, um, based on their ranking, they lowered rank um, and they managed to get secure a job in general surgery instead of ENT, um, what would their application in terms of applying for SC3 be and how would it affect them? Because I know a lot of people are concerned if you know they've got a CST job and they want to keep it. Um, what would how would that affect them? Could they be able to swap it, or are they able to, after they complete it, do another six months to get into ST three, and how would it affect them? Yeah, so that, yeah, so that's good. That is a good question. So there are various options that I've seen multiple, um, kind of some of my colleagues kind of do. I was fortunate that the program that I got into has had all the jobs that I wanted, but some people, as you say, want to do ENT, end up getting a kind of. Um, get get given a general surgery themed job or kind of an orthopedics themed job such situations there are multiple options so during the application and the um, interview cycle uh, or kind of the shortlisting cycle um, there'll be multiple rounds where you can upgrade your offers so um, as people kind of see oh uh, I don't want to do ENT I don't want to do orthopedics some people will, will withdraw their applications and maybe reapply the next year or have applied to multiple specialties like GP and medicine and have taken a job elsewhere. So there'll be opportunity to, if jobs open up for you to kind of upgrade your job into those roles, it's quite hard um, to do things like, um, to, to get into um, rotations like ENT themed ones because they're quite competitive generally. Um, but another option that I've seen people do as well is, um, you get into core surgical training, you have a general surgical themed job and you want to do ENT, you can swap jobs with people. So you just approach the, anyone in the, uh, any of your colleagues in the, in the deanery that you want to swap with. If someone, someone wants to swap with you, again, ENT will be hard to swap as an example, but um, if someone wants to swap with you, you can just, you can just swap them, get your um, their training program director to, to, to give the okay on it. And you can just do a straight swap, try and do that as early as possible in the year. Uh, and push comes to shove. In theory, um, they say they say core surgical training should prepare you to apply to any specialty. But in reality, um, having a theme program will, will prepare you better. So if you haven't had the specific experience in that specialty, then taking years out, doing a clinical fellow year, uh, kind of after core training, or, or doing things like that are, are other options um, as well. So there are there are options. It's a problem that people do find themselves in. I think I think the only other option is reapplying and withdrawing, reapplying if you're set on 
a specific rotation or specific um, location, um, reapplying, strengthening your CV, into improving your interview, and then taking it from there. Does that does that answer your question, or is there anything else? Yeah, I think um, that was that was all right. Um, I was going to say there's a few other questions I seen. Uh, well, we, uh, basically, just a, re a regular question. We'll just go through the list. Um, so someone asked, when is a timeline for the recruitment period um, and where can they find it? So yeah, you can find that um, on on the, if you just you can search into Google. Um, uh, so th this kind of timeline, you can search into Google and um, course critical training timeline. They'll come up with an applicant handbook. Maybe I'll just share that actually. Um, uh, where's that gone? Share that. Uh, not that one. Not that one. This one. So the course surgical training CT1 supplementary applicant handbook. To search it on Google, you can find it on the Yorkshire and Humber kind of surgical training and kind of website as well. Um, but I just, I just, I literally just got this on Google. Um, and it was generally it will show you the um the timeline and you can find it on there and when you're applying on Oriel, Oriel is the website that you use to apply and um, for for any specialty training in this country um and it will be published on there as well um and basically since we're like towards the end of powerpoint and taiwo has um uh like gone through the powerpoint very smoothly um if anybody wants to just directly unmute themselves and just um or just put what you can do put your hands up and yeah that might be better yeah I'll, I'll unmute you and then you can ask any questions directly that's okay in the meantime um i have another question if someone said hi i'm an in incoming fifth year medical student i wanted to ask um how disadvantaged would you be if you don't do academic foundation training because I'm guessing in terms of like maybe building a uh, a research based portfolio like a audit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So academic um, foundation program doesn't it doesn't disadvantage you. I mean, it can advance. It can give you some advantages in the sense of um, getting you involved with the department academically. But because the rotation, the uh, academic pro foundation program rotation is generally either a four month rotation or it's like a day a week. Um, um kind of during the whole year the various way it works with, that some there's oftentimes not very much scope to um to get any kind of anything meaningful published so very rarely people kind of do something get something published in that actual year they, sometimes they can get something published from the work they've done in that year later on but it's quite hard to, such a kind of for short period of time to do anything meaningful um, as far as a meaningful outcome, a meaningful product. So it wouldn't disadvantage you um, when applying for course surgical training. I personally didn't, and I kind of ranked quite highly in the country. May I, I might have, um, uh, might I have kind of got higher in the country if I had that, that um, academic um, job, which was um, you have more free time, you can do more things like audits and that kind of thing, I imagine, perhaps. Um, but if you if you're interested in the academic foundation program, by all means apply for it. Um, I wouldn't be able to give you much advice about it because I didn't apply or, or do it. Okay. Um. And yeah, man. I was just going to. So I I worked with Tyra for a few months. Um. We were working urology placement, but um, he can tell you a bit more than I can. How how was your encore life and how how did you manage day to day working life? Yeah. So um, encore life. So. It, it will vary by job um, and it will vary by role. So I found that um, uh, also in urology, where I was with, where I was with um, Jabril, um, causing Jabril no, no end of problems, um, I found that the on-calls were, were fine. So at my level, I, I covered, um, I had a choice to whether or not I covered urology or covered kind of thoracics and other things out of hours. And generally on calls were not too busy the the, the number of on calls can 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 take a toll in terms of um uh like also for instance on my, on my current job i do kind of between one and three and one and four weekends the average number of hours you work a week is 48 but in reality as a core trainee in order to become better at surgery you have to be operating and that means sometimes coming in early and leaving late so most weeks i 
coming early and leaving late and leave late. Um, um, and some days I've actually come in on my days off as well. But that's just that's besides this point. That's because I was in, I was I was interested in the Pacific operation that was happening on that day. So the the what sucks about surgical training is that in order to get good at surgery, you have to be doing, you have to be in the hospital, you have to be in theatre, um, and that that will mean um, post nights, for instance, staying a bit early, staying a bit later to get involved in operation or. Um, I know a couple of times uh, where I had not been on call, um, I've stayed late to do an appendix. As an SHO, doing an appendix is kind of something you need to be, you want to be able to do. And I've thankfully done a few appendixes now, um, just because of just for fighting for the opportunities to do so. So the on calls, um, um, I'm not sure who, what level of person's asking, if it's a foundation doctor or a medical student. Um, if it's a foundation doctor, it'll be no different than an F2 on call in terms of the, the frequency. Um, but um, and if you're not on the registrar road to the CT2, um, but um, um, you, there is more kind of, um, you have to do in your, of your own volition, like coming in later, uh, coming in earlier, leaving later, just to get more opportunity to operate. Yeah, great. So I was going to lead up to the follow-up question, like how did you manage um, getting a third time, basically, because... Obviously, as a course as a trainee, there's, there's all the ward stuff that you need to worry about. And then, so yeah, I wanted to ask was um, third time and clinics. How did you manage with both? Yeah, so it, again, it will vary by job. So um, I'll tell you the two different experiences I've had this year. So in my urology rotation, um, my, uh, my CT, my first, my job prior to what I'm doing now, um, I I didn't get given a, a time a timetable. So I just come into work and I was kind of, just tried to go to theatre and just tried to go to clinic as much as I could. So depending on how things were on the ward, um, if the ward was well staffed, if I felt that the people on, as far as the F1s and F2s who were on, were relatively independent and I could kind of afford to go to theatre, then I'll just go to theatre and try to come back in between cases and try to be helpful. Um, oftentimes I go to um, attend the ward round and then once the ward round finished, maybe go to clinic afterwards. So it was more, it was quite self-directed. Um, and as you find as a core trainee, that is the that's one of the main perks of being a core trainee. Um, they don't you're very rarely rotated in. So they see you, they see you more supernumerary than the F2s when it comes to ward staffing. So they see that you're you're a surgical trainee in your own right, and you need to learn how to operate. You need to learn how to be a registrar. So they that you have more. Um, you have more latitude to to do that kind of thing, which which is which is good, um, and which is the way you need it to be. Um, um, I'm not sure if that that no that helps. Basically, just be, be proactive essentially and just try. Yeah, it, it's self directed. Yeah, someone asked. Obviously, you spoke a bit more about this earlier, but they said um, in terms of being on call in urology, I know you. When, when I did on-call urology, we were basically covering the same thing, but um, mm. what, like, what, sorry, I'm trying to read a question. Can we off the on-call night shifts? Like, I'm guessing how, how are the night shifts basically as a urology on-call? Did you, because I'm, I'm, from what I remember, like, there's not many cases happening overnight, um, but what, in your opinion, what do you think? Yeah, so um, in my I mean, yeah, so urology as a specialty is not to, there aren't very many spe um, emergencies that occur overnight. Um, your odd torsion, your odd infectious obstructive system, your odd priapism, um, maybe a, a, an iatrogenic injury of a kidney or a bladder or something, or a ureter, not, not really very much that happens overnight as far as emergencies. Um, you do get admissions, but again, it's not as frequent as something like general surgery or orthopedics. So the nights are, they can be busy, but mostly they're, they're okay. Um, at, my, at the core training level, because the urology registrars generally are not on site, I personally did my best to, um, um, because the way it worked in Nottingham, for instance, is that you'd mostly cover just the urology admissions ward um, as a urology at night, but I tried my best to support the elective urology side as well. Um, so sometimes if there's a sick patient on the elective urology side, then I'd go and see the patient with their F1 uh, and relay whatever I needed to be done uh, to the registrar and, and try to act up sometimes, yeah. But for the most part, it's fine. 
you're in um you're doing your general surgery now right um yeah uh, yeah how does that differ um in terms of on calls in that sense yeah so on calls are rougher general <laughs> surgery definitely <laughs> they're definitely rougher um um so as a general surgical sho um you you're on calls you're not really you don't really do much ward cover on call you primarily especially well, in derby which is where i'm working you primarily do um uh, admissions so you work on the admissions unit um you're expected to act with relative independence compared to the f1s and f2s who are also working there um obviously you escalate what you need to but the, the registrars would expect you to be able to just do more stuff um, independently um such as drain abscesses things that can be done under local anesthetic they expect you just to crack on with um um and yes, um, but the, the nights can be busy. The nights can be busy in terms of the number of missions you get in general surgery compared to urology. Um, mm. But you get through it. Uh, you got through med school, you can get through most things. <laughs> 100%, 100%. Um, that's as far as the questions I've received so far. Um, anything else you want to mention, Ty, before we wrap up? Uh, no, I mean, just just kind of all the best. Um, I've got, I mean, I've got five more minutes if anyone wants to ask questions verbally um yeah i mean if anybody wants to like unmute themselves and, and and ask any questions um they'll appreciate it. one thing i wanted to say guys was um um if um yeah please if um i want to appreciate i want to first i want to thank ty for um joining me today explaining uh core surgical training i mean me personally i don't think i would be a surgeon but you're almost convincing me man so you know you did a great job <laughs> And um, if you guys can go and chat and um, fill out the feedback form, that would be uh, greatly appreciated um, for us as we're trying to do more of these sessions. And um, yeah, time man, that was, um, that was that was very well done. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I think if, if nobody else has any questions, I'm going to stop recording. Um, yeah.